Welcome to The Dirt on the Past, a program of the Extreme History Project that explores the good, the bad, and the ugly about our human past. Because, let's face it, Crystal. Yep, history is not pretty, but it is so important to know. Because it is the very thing that has led us to the most critical concerns that we have in the present. So join me, Nancy Mahoney. And me, Crystal Alegria. As we talk to archaeologists and historians who have been digging in the dirt. And in the archives. To uncover the fascinating histories that are not only relevant to today's issues. But help us move forward in a better way with a deeper understanding of our past. Okay, welcome everybody to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we are co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week we are at the KGLT studios speaking in person with Micah Chang about Camp Caroline, um, an archaeological site and historic site in the Homestake Pass area just southeast of Butte. And we're really excited to talk with Micah about his involvement in this project. But first, Crystal, let's check in. How was your week? A good and busy week, as usual. We're excited to start our 12th season of the Extreme History Project Lecture Series tonight. I'm excited. So so right after um, we do this podcast, I'm going to head over to the Museum of the Rockies here in Bozeman, and we're going to have our first lecture of the season. So I'm pretty excited about that. I can't believe we've been doing them for 12 years. Years. (laughs) Years. <laughs> oh my gosh. Is Once that, a month is for that 12 right? years. 12 years. Yeah. yeah. So, well, this will be the start of the 12th oh season. Oh my goodness. So, wow. so, yeah, it's it's um, been, we've had a lot of people come through and speak in the lecture series, and it's great. We usually have a really good crowd, and tonight is going to be uh, no exception. We're going to have a great speaker, Amanda Hendricks Komodo, who's a professor in the history department here at Montana State University. So we're excited for her presentation awesome. this yeah. evening. Are you coming, Nancy? I'm coming. I'm Good. coming. Good. I have to. I have to do a little car juggling, but I'm definitely <laughs> going to be there. So yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. So how was your week? Uh, cold. It was cold. Um, I feel like I. You settled back in at work. We're back from Vegas and all of that stuff with the stores, and that's settling down. But then I feel like the other side of my brain has started to kick in again because now it's time to get our abstracts ready for the Montana Archaeology Society yeah. meetings, which is exciting because this is really the first time we're all going to be back in person again. So I will be co-author on a paper with Mike Neely about the um, Bergstrom bison kill site that we excavated several years ago in Garneal which is sort of dead center, just a little bit away from Lewistown, Montana. And then you and I are going to be talking about The Dirt on the Past, our podcast, yeah. at the meetings. Um, so we're we're excited about that. I'm excited to do that. And um, I'm excited that I'm here with someone uh, from the history department, since it's been so a long time since I've been back in school. So let's uh, let's get back to our guest. Yeah, we? we're yeah. so glad to have you with Welcome, us today, Micah. Micah. Welcome. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here, and I feel... Uh, Really honored that I was invited to come chat with you both today. Uh, well, we are, we're we're going to have you here today, and we're probably going to have you back again um, to talk about your dissertation okay. yeah. at some point. So we're going to start off by telling our listeners a little bit about you. So Micah Chang is currently a Ph.D. candidate in the Department of History and Philosophy at Montana State University, and he's planning on defending his dissertation in April of 2023, right? He's nodding, which so is, that's yeah. exciting. Which is just around the corner. I know, it sort of makes my heart palpitate <laughs> yeah. just thinking about it. Okay, so his research focuses on this interplay among race, agriculture, and environment on the northern Great Plains of the American West, and we will probably circle back around to that, and we're actually having him here today to talk not about his own specific research, but his involvement in this project um, surrounding Camp Caroline. Yeah. So, Micah, before we dive into that, um, into talking with you about Camp Caroline, I just wanted to uh, go back a little bit and ask you what brought you into the field of history. When did you decide to study history and what brought you to MSU's history department? Yeah, I think uh, that's a fun story. (laughs) I probably like most history majors, did not intend to enter into college and become a history major. Um, I was at community college when I was 18, and I took a really fabulous class that just kind of changed my perception about how history could uh, 
be utilized to look at the past and inform the present. And I thought it was pretty powerful. Um, in particular, mm. we were reading the book by Iris Chang called The Rape of Nanking. Mm. Oh, and it just wow. really um, stuck with me and resonated with me. And it, I thought it was an emotional way to tell history. Um, and from there, I knew I wanted to go into graduate school by the time I finished my undergraduate degree. And when I thought about why um, that particular work about uh, Nan King motivated me, it was really because of the family connection that wow. I could see there and seeing um, the diaspora, my dad's side of the family being pushed out of China uh, and into Southeast Asia. And I realized that what really makes me passionate about history is seeing my own family and myself in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and my mom's side of the family is from the Montana High Line in the northern and eastern part of the state. So that's what brings you to do history on this part. Yep. Okay. And that's how I ended up at MSU was uh, the focus on environment um, and in particular, you know, the connection to agriculture and us being at an agricultural institution. Uh, that was kind of the deciding factor to come to um, Montana State. And also, it's a lot easier to get to Malta, Montana from Bozeman than it is from Huntington Beach, California. Yeah, really. <laughs> but it's still hard. It's still a long way. It's still a long way. From I know I've done that drive. Malta. I'm yeah. sure you've done that drive, too. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And um, well, I loved what you said, because I think we are all about the relevance of history to the present. And I think there's so much we don't understand about who we are as individuals, but also as groups and as a nation and beyond um, until we understand all these amazing stories from our past. Mm -hmm. And just talking about that diaspora, that's that's a lot of complicated and necessary history for people to understand. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been hearing about Camp Caroline for a little while now, both Crystal and I, that there has been a project afoot several years ago. I attended a meeting with archaeologist Amy Swartz, and this was really exciting because Amy had some undergraduate connections, I think, at the University of Montana, but now she works on um, the the Forest Service, the Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest, I believe. And so this project is centered around a historical site. So there's a physical place. It's outside of Butte. It's on the forest. But there's only been a little bit of work done. And the idea was to bring together both Montana State University, I think, and U of M with the Forest Service and get a whole bunch of people on board to do some actual field work, um, both in the archives and out on the landscape. So if you could give us a little bit of background on Camp Caroline itself, where it is, um, why is it called Camp Caroline? And and then even how you, Micah, got involved in the project, and maybe that's a good place to start. Yeah, I think I'll start there. Um, I got involved with the project. I actually was at that initial meeting with you, and I can't remember. It feels like it was pre-COVID. I think um, it was. Yeah. I think it was. But my mind is very fuzzy for the last I two or three I think all of years. ours are, yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, it, you know, it was cool to see an idea come yeah. to an actual, you know, deliverable and product. And that happened last summer. Um, in the early in the spring semester, uh, Janet, Professor Janet Orr in the history department here at Montana State University, who's a public historian, um, was able to work with Amy Swartz and Mike Ryan and um, actually put this camp together. And the way I got involved is uh, Dr. Orr needed um, somebody who could help her. And as a graduate student, I was hired as a graduate student research assistant. And I was doing the logistics for the camps. So I was in charge of the fun things like making sure people were fed and making sure people had a place to use the bathroom <laughs> and making sure that uh, <laughs> rides were, were organized and situated. Um, and it was really fun because from the get-go, it was a collaborative process with Amy and Mike and the Forest Service, as well as University of Montana. Um, so almost every step along the way, there was uh, all three institutions working together to ensure that, for example, um, students who took this field camp would get course credits in the summer and on the the archaeological side of things making sure that they would get that professionalization in the form of a field school 
Right, um, right. So let's back up a little bit so people know what we're talking about. Because that first meeting when you got an email, I got an email, Crystal got an email, couldn't go, you know, that room was just kind of them talking about this specific place, which, mm-hmm. which we'll get to the history of that. But it was a diverse group of people brought together. So we had academics from two institutions and then professionals for the Forest Service. And you probably had no idea you were going to be dealing with toilets no. from that first meeting. <laughs> no idea. I certainly did not see that coming for you either. Um, <laughs> I remember just being excited that there was um, a site that had women involved in owning a mine and then African-Americans homesteading in this area and involved in Butte early on, late 1800s, turn of the century, and thinking this was a whole part of Montana history that I didn't really know much about. Mm -hmm. And as an archaeologist, I was sort of desperate to know if there were things still left on the ground. And then Kelly Dixon being a really amazing Uh, historical archaeologists from U of M, just everybody putting in all of their expertise and thinking this is a no-brainer for a field school. And I figure, I think that was my last touchstone from that was that everyone in the room felt the ideal way to tackle this project was to have researchers from the forest, from the universities, but also then to involve students to do actual field work do research in the archives, just do on the ground. So you had to handle logistics for that. (laughs) But you probably got a little bit involved in the research. So tell us a little bit about Camp Caroline itself, how it got its name, what it is, and all that. Yeah, I'll... uh... I'll say what I know, but the cool thing, and and you just mentioned it, is it was really Mm. student-driven. Students were given ownership of certain people in the past and aspects of Camp Caroline, and they both learned archaeological field methods and how to do professional history research in an archive. Um, But what I know of Camp Caroline is um, the Camp Caroline area is named after a woman who is known in the oral histories and in the archival sources we have as Carolyn Van Horn, Mm -hmm. who's a German woman who was born in the 19th century. Um, There's like a lot of intrigue and mystery surrounding her. And some of it almost feels like myth history. And, Mm. you know, this is the first year. Urban legends. Yeah, urban legends. A little urban legend in there. (laughs) Very fitting for Butte history. Right, right. Um, (laughs) And it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, I'm impressed with what came together in the first year, and I'm really excited to see how this continues to grow. Because what we know about Carolyn Van Horn right now isn't a whole lot. Um, but what we do find about her in the archive is, you know, she left Germany and she had some kind of businesses on the east coast of the United States after, after she immigrated to America. And she found her way to Montana and eventually um, invested in the Blackwell mine, I believe. And... Her investment and her name there, and she's also said to have bought bought and brought up a 10-stamp mill to Mm. the area, which is apparently still on the ground today. Um, Did she live in that area, or did did she live in Butte, or did she just invest and visit? Do you know? That's the unknown part, Ah, Um, because, you know, there's... there's, She wasn't in the area for long. Okay. So we do know she leaves sometime um, before the mine closes. So she's she leaves sometime around 1907, I think. Um, and there's various reasons for why she leaves. But one of my favorites is that the authorities were after her because of like these charges <laughs> I, of fraud. I like this lady. <laughs> yeah. Because there's some there was something I had read in some of the information you shared that she had been married to some wealthy German maybe prince, you know, which yeah. adds to the intrigue. But then <laughs> the marriage wasn't going well. And I don't know if there was a divorce or if she just left, but maybe she had some means. But how she gets from there all the way across Europe to the U.S. and then all the way to Butte, Montana. Yeah. It's kind mm-hmm. of a mystery. Yeah, it's fascinating. And she leaves behind this amazing namesake of Camp Caroline, which um, one of your questions was, where is it located? Right. And, I mean, just truthfully, we don't know because in the sources, it seems that Camp Caroline refers to the entire area north of the Homestake Pass okay. rather than just one specific mine or one specific site. Uh, okay. Because... Um, The Brown family, for example, they had land in several different parcels north of Homestake. Okay, and this is an African-American family. We're going to talk about them in a little bit. But they they actually had homesteaded in that area as well. Yes. Okay. And 
their buildings were very far apart, but they referred to the whole area as Camp Carolina, huh. mm -hmm. rather than just like near the mine, the whole area north of Homestake Path or of Homestake where the railroad was okay. seems to be referred to as Camp Caroline. So the railroad mm -hmm. goes through I only know the pass because when you drive to Butte it says Homestake Pass. Yes. And then mm -hmm. I've gotten off there and there's the Homestake um lodge where you can do cross country skiing. Have mm. either of you ever gone there? Oh, I've never been there. It's lovely. You mm. should go. Um, you know, there's these little cabins you can rent. You can even bring pets. And um, and then you can cross country ski. It's not scary and it's not too expensive. So mm. it's great. But that area is beautifully wooded and things. And so I'm just sure that it must be sort of this much larger forest because I think it borders onto the forest that they've made trails in there. That must be sort of this big region you're talking about. Yeah, okay. it's... Uh... It's pretty immense back there. Mm. And uh, some of and those... rugged. I yeah. Mean, it seems rugged, right? Yeah. yeah. To get out to some of the sites where we surveyed and did work, yeah. it was um, pretty treacherous. I mean, wow. there was a lot of dead and down trees in the middle of the road, um, wow. a lot of washed out and blown out roads. It's uh, it's pretty Western back there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, but this was a, a mining area. Yeah. And so she... Um, Carolyn had a mine, the Blackwell mine, mm -hmm. and she owned this mine, managed this mine during her time in this area. Is that is that right? Yeah, and it, it, it seems that way. Um, okay. That part does seem to be correct. Yeah. Uh, you know, we know that she was in the area. She invested in the mine. She poured capital into the mine evidenced by the 10 stamp mill brought up by railroad and then transported wow. presumably by cart or so she, know, had yeah. so she had some money. Yeah. So she had some money. Yeah. Okay. But the source of the money is the intrigue, right? And yeah, that's yes. the interesting part. And yeah. then where, where did she it ended all come up? From? I wonder, do you know do you happen to know where she ended up dying um, or where she's buried? One of our students found a few newspaper sources that refer to a Carolyn Van Horn in Chicago oh, after nineteen oh seven. But once again, you know, that's a right. that's like a, just the the crumb trail you're following when you're doing this archival research and you don't yes. just don't really know and you're like, Oh, I wish there was a diary or yeah, something. I know. Well maybe there is one out there that someone will find eventually. Because you guys are kind of in your beginning research. I mean, you know, you the students just started this research last summer, right? So there's yeah. still a lot more to go. So maybe they'll find Carolyn and where she ended up. But, um, you know, and, and we have to think about Butte at this time, too. Butte was no podunk little town, kind of like it is today. I mean, it's, it's, it was this huge Well, I hope center. nobody from Butte I know, I know. I shouldn't say that. You might want to cut that out. <laughs> it's yeah. not podunk. Like, yeah, <laughs> not podunk. <laughs> it's an awesome place. It's really awesome. It's one of my favorite places in the whole world. Oh, but sure, sure, but really it was. it's so much smaller now than it was when she was there. It was yeah. booming at that time. So, um, you know, from her for her going from Butte to Chicago would be not... You know, not strange at all in mm. those days because they were comparable, those two cities very much so, you know. They called Butte the San Francisco of the West yeah. or of, the, of Montana. So it it was a booming place, so it makes sense that she would have come there. So tell us a little bit, Micah, about um, kind of the physical layout of this camp. I'm just trying to get the, the vision of this camp in my head kind of to better understand what this place looked like. You know, was it small? Was it just a little tiny camp with a few buildings or was it larger? What kind of buildings were there? What mm -hmm. kind of, you know, what was happening? Was there a post office? You know, those that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I'll preface by saying that we didn't actually get to go to the site that is Camp Caroline, the Blackwell Mine. Okay. Um, okay. And that's hopefully for a future project. And the exciting part about that is uh, that no one has been up there since the last um, survey done by the former archaeologist, I think in a few decades. Mm -hmm. And there was a massive fire between then and now. Oh, wow. So, Ooh, nice. um, yeah. In terms of scale... It was even the the sites we surveyed where we knew the brown boarding house was and some of their structures and buildings as well as some of their mining activity. It was really large. I mean, we dedicated um, a full day and a half to surveying. And I would say we probably only diligently did the area around the structures and buildings where we knew they once were because the fire burned down most of them. Okay. But there still is one structure up there. Okay. Um, and um, the the mining activity and where they had fenced off for 
and I'm I'm forget if there's a mining buff listening, they're they're probably gonna be upset. But it was like <laughs> they would reroute the water, and I forget what type of mining that is. But the whole landscape was essentially like a sure. big marsh, okay. and um, it was cool to see like just human activity on that land. Yeah. At some point, um, but we went up there and both Mike and Amy hadn't been up there. All they had were these reports that they were working off of. Um, and it was cool to read the report when the boarding house was still standing, I oh, think yeah. sometime in the seventies or eighties. Mm -hmm. And then this big fire happens and oh. then it's no longer there, but there still are. There's some foundations or something left behind. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a structure that's noted on the site map of that that original form that's standing so you can somewhat get a feel okay. for it okay. and um you know there's like mention of they had uh you know like a barn or something here and you could see like the landscape like through an archaeologist's eyes because i'm sure. a historian so yeah. sure. you know yeah. i'm used to like stuffy papers and archives so getting out there and seeing what their archive is on the landscape was really cool yeah right. um and other interesting and really cool things that we found while we were doing the surveying project was um, I'm forgetting the name of their neighbor, okay. but we knew they had a neighbor it, from the oral history and we couldn't, you know, find it on the map or anything, but we just walked, you know, the perimeter and then walked a grid pattern and we found this building and wow. the roof had collapsed. But the cool thing is because the roof had collapsed, um, the roofing now is turned up. And on, oh. on the lumber itself, there was the name of the person. Oh, and my we know... gosh. You never get that lucky. Are yeah. you kidding yeah. me? Yeah, and it was really it's cool. It's like an archaeologist's yeah. dream. I know. You're like, okay, I'm going to write who lived here. <laughs> yeah, and it was cool oh, because then you, you look at the census. And, and it, it lines up with. His name was, his last name was misspelled, but it was like one letter off. Yeah. So yeah. you. So then you can pinpoint it in time and geography. And so, so we know there was a community then. There's a homestead. There's mm -hmm. several buildings. And then beyond that, even there's there's the mine which you didn't get to see but yes. it has been documented and located on the landscape in previous yes. surveys so it it sounds mm -hmm. like it was more than just a camp the way we're thinking of it but it was kind of a community that existed outside of butte yes okay. and mm -hmm. the cool thing about that too is um I think, you know, I think originally Charles Flagg and Richard Brown, when they came, they were up in this area, but eventually they they come down to Butte because, as you said, Crystal, it was, you know, booming right. metropolis, right. growing um, African-American and black community that left the southeast in the 19th century um, and established, you know, this this really vibrant community in Butte. And that's where they ultimately end up living um, by 1900. But they still have that mining claim up in Camp Caroline. Yeah, they, he had a gold mining claim, right? Charles Flagg or something yeah, originally? It, yeah, I believe okay. so. And um, they leave it up there. And the boarding house is, um, you know, the center for both, uh, both members of the Brown family and, you know, white laborers to come and for the mines yeah. or people looking for claims or people passing through. Mm -hmm. So maybe, Micah, you should tell us a little bit about the Brown family and some of the some of the African American families. But maybe Nancy, you should do a station break. I'm gonna first. do a station okay. break. Okay. You are listening to The Dirt on the Past with co hosts Crystal Alegria and Nancy Mahoney on KGVM Bozeman or wherever you find your podcasts. We're speaking today with Micah Chang about an archaeological site called Camp Caroline near Butte, Montana. Okay, so, right. So before Caroline herself, Van Horn, um, and all her mystery came to the area in uh, 1901 or so, as you mentioned, this area around Homestake kind of came to have that name, Homestake Pass, um, and later sort of also became known as Camp Caroline and what grew up around it. But let's talk a little bit about the African-American families that first came out there, who they were, where they came from, and then let's follow up on what you had alluded to, that eventually these families really became part of the society in Butte mm -hmm. itself. And I think this opens up this story of um, a whole thriving African-American community that probably was 
larger population-wise than what we have today. I had read recently that there's probably less than 200 people who identify as African American in, in Butte in the most recent census. And I think at this time, we're talking about the late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a larger community, mm -hmm. which I think is probably, a, you know, to me, was somewhat surprising historically to find yeah. that out. Yeah, I... Uh... Once again, this was really where the students did a lot of the heavy lifting, you know, doing the genealogical research and di really diving in. Um, our main sources for the narrative of the uh, of Charles Flagg and the Brown family eventually come from a series of oral histories in which anyone can access on the Montana Memory Project. Oh, fantastic. Oh, so um, Lena Slauson's in particular was one that I listened to, and uh, that's where my information comes. I believe there's... Um, another one or two of the Brown family dedicated pretty much to them um, that you can access on the Montana Memory Project. And so the the Browns, is it Richard Brown married into the Flagg family? Yes. Okay. Yes, I believe that is correct. Um, and there and the, were... Go sorry, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say, I think he, he married Charles and Elizabeth's daughter, but then it really becomes sort of the Brown family history that we think of because... He came out and had engineering skills. Mm -hmm. And then I think he ended up really staying and getting involved. I guess at that time I had read something, Micah, that um, if you were African-American, you weren't allowed to go underground in the mines in Butte. And this was such a big mm -hmm. deal because, I mean, mining history, labor history, everything about Butte is so important. But do you know the reason why the Anaconda Company was against letting any African-Americans go underground? Because I think mm -hmm. that's where the real money probably jobs were, right? Yeah. Underground. And I believe Marcus Daly's, and and you both might know better than I, I do, but Marcus Daly explicitly said that it was to pro it was to protect them and prevent them from violence against... Racial violence? Uh, racial violence uh, underground. Okay. Um, whether or not that was a genuine belief for their own well-being or whether that a was... A way to just keep them separate. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Um and interestingly enough, uh, a Brown descendant, I believe Hiawatha Brown is the first to work. To actually, so that changed eventually. Yeah, I think pretty late though. I think 1940s or 50s. Oh my goodness, um, wow. So yeah, we're talking like generations of Browns. I think he might be the grandson of right. Richard Brown. Right. So, so their whole family stayed in the area. Yeah, it, at least for a period up until, um, I think they had a really big family. I think there were a number of children, and I don't want to throw a number out, but I believe it was over 10. Okay. Um, and some of them did stay in Butte until they died. Um, and another Brown descendant, I am forgetting which daughter, became the first black cheerleader in Butte. Yeah, um, so, yeah I read that, yeah. yeah. So they have this cool connection to the history of the place. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, we gave, uh, Amy Swartz and I gave this public talk to the Butte public back sometime in August or September of 2022. And, you know, you mentioned the Brown family. And then at the end in the Q&A, everyone's like, oh, I know this, this, uh, this Brown. This, that's yeah. so this Brown. exciting. And so there's a direct lineage, really, yeah. you know, all the way back to this, this it, early period. Go and ahead, so what were the, what was the Brown family? What was Richard Brown doing in this, in Homestake? Was he farming? Was he ranching? Was he um, mining? Yeah, he, he came to mine, which okay. um, I believe, you know, I don't want to speak for Amy or the Forest Service here, but I believe that's what makes this site so important on our national forest lands okay. is that this is one of the only African-American mining claims in the nation, if I understand it correctly. Okay. Um, wow. And I don't know the history of, you know, exclusionary um, policies or right. um, ac acts, but I do know that this is a very, very important site for the Forest Service. And that's why there's a lot of energy around this project. And I think I'm really excited to continue to follow it and see how it develops in the next few years, because it has a lot of steam, um, yeah. at least for the year I participated in it. Okay. So they, so the Brown family um, mined up in this homestake area and homesteaded it as well, right? Yeah. I think initially, okay. yes. Okay. They, they initially had a homestead. Um, 
And this is a, the part where, you know, we're a little unclear on, but I think their homestead was initially that area we surveyed, which became the boarding house. Okay. okay. Be- I think once they leave their homestead, they move to Butte and they retain the boarding house. Okay. And they have this dual presence both in Camp Carolyn and in Butte. So they kind of go back and forth. Yeah. Which and, probably a lot of people did. Yeah. yeah. And I think... Um, we have a railroad expert here at Montana State University, Dale Martin, and he actually mapped out the timetables and said it was possible for the Browns to leave Butte in the morning, get to Homestake on the railroad, presumably get to their boarding house sometime in the middle of the day, do whatever they needed to do, and make it back to Butte by evening. Oh, fascinating. Yeah. I had no idea that. So there would have been a stop and they would have been able to get on the railroad. Yes. Oh, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. That that made it a lot easier, I'm sure, to get up there and to work up there, mm-hmm. um, that the rail went right to Homestake and there was a, a stop there. So so then um, this family kind of lived in Butte but worked in Homestake and kind of went back and forth. And, and so they uh, the family just grew. And is there still Brown descendants in Butte now or descendant community members at all that you know of, Micah? We know that there's one man up in this area who still has a piece of land with the last name Brown. Okay. So we're making the assumption. We've we've tried to contact him. Okay. Um, so, yeah, to we'll follow up on to that be, question okay. here. To on that. Be yeah. So that's another thing we should point out. This project, this this last field season, was just the this first real foray out with students and everybody, but you guys plan to go out again this summer, or you might be not as involved, but there's another plan to do field work. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, and I'm going to make a plug here for the field school for any MSU students, Montana State students, or University of Montana students who want to get involved. Um, This year, in the summer, um, there's going to be two sessions. The first session will be June 5th through 9th, and the second session will be June 12th through 16th. And this is open to undergraduates and graduate students at either Montana State University or University of Montana. And if they're interested, they can send a CV and a resume to Amy Swartz. Um, and I'll figure out how to get the contact. We'll make, a, yeah, we'll we make sure a, there's a link. Yeah, we can put a link on the on the, face, or on the podcast page. Cool. Yeah. But, so. um yeah, so it's an ongoing project, and nice. they're going to continue this this awesome work. And I think the goal, at least the last time I heard, was to make it out to the mine itself. Okay. See Carolyn Van Horn's That's alleged me- ten stamp mill. <laughs> um, that that would be yeah. amazing. Crystal, I, I think you and I are going to have to we go have out to go and out. go see yeah. what's going on. Yeah. I'd like to be in the field, but I want to hear a little bit more about the porta potty. So yeah. for the students, <laughs> before we go out, who we might to want to yeah, know the whole situation, not only for here. us because yeah. we could always commute, but but if you're going to be a student who's going to apply for this, just so we can be clear, um, will it will it be a similar situation as what you did last year? What will it be like? Will there be camping mm-hmm. for the students? So they'll be out in the field for a week camping. Yes. Okay. That's that's the um, are there grizzly bears? That's the first thing they want to know. <laughs> <laughs> or snakes. Ha- we'll have bear spray. I, we had one of the first things we did was make a pack list. And oh, yeah. uh, we did this with Amy and bear spray was one of the top items. Yeah. But it's camping, but I would call it glamping yes. because it was pretty <laughs> awesome. Okay. You um, mentioned the food was fantastic. The food yeah. was fantastic. And I, I will say if Mike Ryan is listening, you're a fantastic cook and <laughs> I expect great things. It was a long way Good. to keeping people happy and on track and doing, getting their work food. done. Yeah, good yeah. food. Absolutely. Okay. But it was, well it, done, was Mike. it was like campfire kind of culture. And nice. it, um, it was fun to do class by the campfire, you know, and sitting yeah. on the dirt and y- your whiteboard is the side of a white trailer. Yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> That's so cool. It, it was it was really I've never experienced anything like it and ah, it was it was pretty wonderful. cool. Wonderful. Yeah. So we when we had our field school in Virginia City, we were staying in one of the the old historic it was a a, a hospital or run by yeah. the nuns. Yeah. But um by the end none of the students would actually stay there. <laughs> They drive back and forth because they were convinced it was haunted. And I blame Crystal for that. 
No. Because she sees ghosts. Well, yes. no, <laughs> because I brought Ellen Baumler um, to to give us a ghost tour, which was probably the wrong idea. Yeah. Because then, you know, the last stop on the ghost tour was the place everyone was staying, which was, which, what, oh, the name of the and place. And there were stories. Why remember. are we forgetting? Yeah. But the long story short is you're safer yeah. camping. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. just do that. <laughs> You don't have to stay in a haunted Absolutely. hotel that way. <laughs> <laughs> Just a haunted forest. Right. <laughs> so the the goal will be then to maybe do um, some more survey. There'll definitely be more of an archival component to probably advance on what students did previously mm-hmm. to locate the, the mine and see what they can document there, especially since some of these areas have burned. You had mentioned a couple things when we were talking before that I want to get back to. One is that you said there were some artifacts that you guys came across mm-hmm. and folks like Kelly Dixon and Amy Schwartz and people um, were able to identify some of these things. Just tell us a little a little bit about some of the things you all found. Yeah, it was, it was fun watching undergrads get excited about finding trash. Trash, yeah. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it was cool seeing what archaeologists can do with trash. Yeah. Things that I it shocked me. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know you historians usually snub your nose at us, but we actually have a pretty cool job. That's right. It's uh, <laughs> we we like our our smelly, dusty paper. <laughs> yes, um, yes, that you can read. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but some of the things we found um, included, like in the archive, there was a very brief mention of how excited the Browns were when they finally got a Model A Ford. Oh, um, nice. oh, wow. And we found a beat up old tailgate no. and Mike identified it right away. I'm not a car guy. So he was like, that's it. Oh, that's and, insane. And it was wow. on the property wow. across the road from the boarding house. So wow. like without, I would say without a doubt. Right. Wow. So that was one exciting thing. Um, and then like one of the classes we had in the camp was like, okay, we're looking for a can dump and the trash dump. And we, we were able, the students were able to find, um, I think it was a perfume bottle Mm -hmm. that was like blue and Mm -hmm. Kelly Dixon went through and documented how, you know, when you look along the seams, you could date this bottle because of X, Y, and Z on how the sides come together, as well as the chemical in the glass that turns it blue after exposure to UV. Right. So just these really cool methods, especially for... I've gotten a lot of science developed around the the history of manufacturing all Mm. those bottles, how they traveled where, and what happened to them. And I I find that with, with cans and nails and bottles there's so much historians can do to to get you into an accurate date time period which yeah. is cool um the last find i'll tell you about that i would have i would have just chucked it i would have just thrown it or kicked it was uh amy pulled this big femur looking bone and said this Whoa. is a butchered bone yeah. this isn't like this isn't like moose died here carcass this is a human butchered this bone so how did she know that i am probably going to botch this too um but we'll help you (laughs) the way the cross section was on the middle of the femur nice uh, it was just really clean yeah and it was probably cut cut. by something metal rather than because they i know like jack um fisher and others who you know have expertise in analyzing bone you can tell the difference between something cut by metal or cut by a stone tool or something Mm -hmm. like that so it must have been or you know Teeth gnaw marks versus other yeah. cut marks. Yeah. So you can tell you can tell those bones, and we call them saw cut bones because they have that. You can see where they were cut, where mm. they were butchered, yeah. by a butcher, by someone who had metal tools. So, so yeah, they're getting ideas of what they're eating, of what kind of products they have up there. So there is some archaeology to recover to add to the historical record, flesh out their day to day life a yeah. little bit. And as a historian, I thought the archaeological stuff was actually a lot more telling than what we found in the archive so far. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we also recovered time-appropriate porcelain, oh, I believe, yeah. Yeah. Um, a carbide lamp, which places wow. it right at the correct time period. Wow. So, um, And the cool thing yeah. is, is that you guys are looking in the archives and the mm-hmm. archaeological site, which is what any archaeologist does, but then you're seeing, like, the fender of the Ford, you know, Model T or whatever it was, you know, mm-hmm. in both places. And that's what's really exciting. Yeah, it yeah. was really cool. That yeah. was That was a cool find for me. Yeah. Because it's like it's verifying. That convergence is is so important. But then also I think, you know, you get a much fuller picture when you have both 
the historical record and the physical record. I also think there's there's something about seeing those documents, especially if there's someone's handwriting on it. But there's also something amazing about touching those artifacts that you know somebody was using, who you're researching, you know, yeah. and, and you're getting a little window into what their life was like. And then the oral histories on top of it. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's the... Mm, that, the trifecta. The, that's the trifecta. You don't usually have that. Yeah. Um, so that's amazing, too. There the, was oh, sorry. Go, sorry no, go ahead, Micah. I, I was just gonna say I loved the oral histories because the people who did the oral histories, Lena Slauson, they contributed to like the Butte Women's Cookbook. Oh yes, oh. And yes. In the articles we found from a later period, remembering the boarding house, but like probably 1950s, they have those recipes, so you can. Oh my! You, can, you could imagine what was being served because yes. they said it closed in the 1930s or whatever, so it isn't too much later. Yeah. Surely you'd have a recipe that gave you a clue. Oh, wow, that's, amazing. that's, that's very cool. cool. Yeah. That's cool. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, well, it is. sounds like there's a lot more that we're still going to learn yeah. about mm-hmm. this um, Camp Caroline, but also more about this um, rich, diverse African American community in Butte. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what? So you plan to go out again? Again next summer, Micah, and then um, will it be kind of similar where, the, where there'll be archival work and field work, or is there other um, aspects that are going to be added on this next field season? Yeah, I, I'm not sure about the mechanics, um, but I would imagine the heart of the field school will still say, stay the same. And the course on the catalog is listed as, um, let me make sure I don't me- me- mess this up. It's okay. called Federal Archaeology immersive field experience. And I will say that, you know, we invited people from the State Historic Preservation Office. We had other archaeologists from other federal land agencies come out. And we had practitioners and academics come. And I think, ultimately, it was just a really cool way to get a feel for a career option for both of these um, fields, archaeology and history, and seeing what was out there. Yeah. So even though the field school may look different in terms of who's invited or, you know, whether they do more field work and a little less on the um, the archival side, I think the core will still say the same to expose students to methods from both fields, um, but ultimately, you know, give them a taste for what this career path could look like. That's great. And, you know, going into history or archaeology and getting a job with the federal government is is really um, a good job option because right now there's a lot of federal employees retiring, and so there's going to be a lot of job openings in these fields. So Mm -hmm. it's a good thing for students to go into. I always encourage students to try to get their foot in that door because it's a great job. And you're making a connection with a a person who's already yeah. there. So, mm-hmm. and those those things sometimes come up if there's an internship possibility. So that's mm-hmm. a wonderful experience. Well, I'm so glad you got to have that experience because you've had a lot of experience in the archives, I'm sure, and doing history. And then this just really rounds out a whole other sense of of what what you can do or add in mm-hmm. your own career. That's exciting. Um, so, Micah, there's so much more you know we could talk about with you, and we hope to have you back again. Uh, We've run out of most of our time today, so we just want to thank you for taking the time and sort of being the the ambassador for talking about Camp Caroline today. And um, really, we hope that we get to visit uh, this summer. Maybe we'll be out there at the same time as you, and perhaps we'll be able able to do some interviews from the site itself, record some things, interview some of the students, which would be really fun, and then maybe round out with being able to give that to our audience with a little bit more on the archaeology and archival research as it develops. I'll make sure to let you know what night steak night is. Oh, there we go. You You know me. You You, you were talking about the ribeye. I know. Like Ryan's ribeye. Then the ribeye, exactly. Yep. (laughs) I'd even take that saw cut bone. I know. (laughs) Oh, I so enjoyed this conversation, Micah. Thanks so much for doing doing this and taking your time to come and sit down with us today. No, thank you. I really admire the podcast and the work that you both have done. It's really an inspiration for me as a sometimes a dusty professional historian getting to see the ways that history can be vibrant and public facing. I know. It's nice to get out and talk to the people, right? I know. Well, thanks, Micah, and thanks to all our listeners out there for joining us today. If you love this podcast, please tell a friend and make sure to subscribe so it shows up in your podcast feed each week and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. Thanks for listening today. 
And we hope you can join us again to find out more about The, the Dirt, Dirt on, on the, the past. past. A big thank you to our editors, Drake Pinnell and Sierra Thomas. Thanks to Lawson Alegria for mixing the music and to John Chadwell for help in getting the podcast out into the world. Thank you.